Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay, nice to meet you, everyone. Uh, my name is Jun Seok Lee, and welcome to the class of machine learning for visual understanding this semester. So uh, today I will uh, briefly introduce our course and um, very brief introduce uh, of the introduction of the computer vision and machine learning. So before we start the course, I would like to ask uh, everyone to turn on your video. This is uh, my basic policy of this course. So I would like to interact with all of you uh, more frequent than uh, other courses probably. So I would like to ask all of you to turn on your uh, video all the time during the class. And you may turn off your audio by default, but when I ask you any questions, uh, you should uh, always be ready to talk um, during the course. And uh, I will talk uh, more about the policy of this um, video and audio stuff uh, in the later slides. But basically, um, yeah, I would like to ask you to turn on the videos uh, always, not just today. If you are not ready today, it might be OK. Uh, you can just uh, turn it off just today. But uh, yeah, later, uh, please be prepared to turn on your video uh, and uh, listen to this lecture. OK. So let me start by introducing myself first. Um, my name is Jun Seok Lee, and where you may see the difference between uh, myself now and myself 10 years ago when I was just starting the graduate study. This is exactly uh, when I just started the graduate study, really. So uh, it's already like 11 years ago. But um, yeah, I couldn't get an even better picture than this after that. So I'm still using it for my profile. And uh, this was my very first computer vision uh, project uh, I've done in my undergraduate. Um, yes, um, one student asked me that uh, I'm sharing the slides. Um, do you see my slides? Oh, OK. Let's just, what happened? Sorry about that. Do you see now? Okay. 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 So yeah, uh, this is my very first uh, work in computer vision. So it was an object tracking for surveillance camera. So it in uh, it was installed in an office like this, um, and there. Uh, so. One camera is actually observing the entire area uh, to see if there's any moving object there. And if it detects some moving objects, uh, basically done by the pixel difference in adjacent frames, we detect uh, some human size or bigger um, moving objects like that, and we label them. And then if we suspect that is a, uh, it may be a, uh, some thief or some uh, suspicious activities, we uh, use another high quality camera to uh, track it, and then take some snapshots automatically. So this was uh, done in 2006. So it's already like 15 years ago. But um, where I used very, very simple techniques for this, but uh, surprisingly, it worked really well. So um, that uh, since that project, I actually got interested in computer vision, even though I didn't use any AI or machine learning, uh, very sophisticated techniques at that time. But uh, it was really fun to work on. So. Uh, I, I remember this project really um, uh, good experience for me. And then I um, moved to another company called Han Game, or it, it's, it was part of uh, NHN, uh, which is the neighbor uh, nowadays. So I, uh, I worked there as a um, server uh, developer, but um, I also was very interested in some data analysis projects like this. So I worked on abusing user detection for uh, hand game, uh, card games, and board games like uh, Baduk or Go. So there are surprisingly many people uh, in the uh, online computer game uh, platforms. Like uh, they would like to get some mon uh, monetary benefit from uh, fooling other uh, people, which is uh, actually harm harming the entire uh, environment. So. Uh, my goal was detecting those abusing users some uh, in some automatic way, 
uh, at that time, everything was done manually by uh, the, the operation teams. So uh, since I introduced very basic uh, automated uh, abusing user detection uh, system, um, that was actually quite impactful. We, we were able to recall like more than 10 times uh, of the abusing users uh, using that automated systems. And then uh, this was the project that I uh, did as uh, my uh, undergraduate thesis in 2009. So that time was around uh, the time that we got started using smartphones in Korea. It, that I, as far as I remember, it was summer of 2009, uh, the iPhone and uh, I'm not sure if Android was there at that time, but some Samsung phones were also uh, getting smarter. So uh, at that time, the, uh, the emergent problem was we had some address books in our traditional phones and in smartphones, and also in our um, email systems like Gmail or Hanmail. So we had all separate uh, address books, and the task was um, detecting who are the same persons and uh, merging them to a single address book. So we don't really uh, worry about these kind of things uh, these days, but uh, it was a quite a hot problem at that time. So uh, these were an example of the toy scale AI projects I've done before I started my graduate study. And then I uh, went to um, Georgia Tech for my PhD. And after five years of my study, I started my job at Google and I uh, spent another six years there. So now I have like 11 or more years of experience in machine learning. Specifically, when I was in graduate school, my research topic was mostly on recommendation systems. Uh, and I used a technique called uh, collaborative filtering or matrix factorization. If you are familiar with that, yeah, uh, I've done, uh, sorry, I see some chatting. No, okay. So yeah, I um, studied recommendation systems at the time. And uh, as a side project, I also did some NLP projects, uh, text mood analysis or uh, some contextual exploration uh, for MSR internship. But if you don't understand these things, it's okay. This is not part of this course. And I, uh, when I, when I, after I graduated, I went to Google and I joined the team called Video Understanding Team. And that was uh, uh, my first, uh, first time experience on modern computer vision uh, and uh, using machine learning. So there, uh, my project was mostly on video representation learning and uh, for video recommendations and video annotations or classifications, especially in large scale. So uh, we will cover some of these topics in this course. And um, now I have more experience in computer vision than uh, recommended systems. And recently, actually, uh, I, 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 by the way, I'm actually working for Google uh, for my half of my time. So uh, I'm teaching this course and um, advise my graduate students for my half time. And the other half, I work for Google. And I am uh, recently moved to um, team actually focusing on the recommended systems again. So nowadays, I'm actually doing both computer vision and uh, recommended systems. So um, this course will be reflecting my experience during uh, the six years of my work at Google, uh, especially in video understanding team. And um, yeah, we will cover all, uh, all of those relevant topics in this course. And um, in addition to uh, work at Google, actually, I have some industry experience from uh, various companies. Uh, so the very first one was the startup called Technovision, where I actually started my uh, work, first work in computer vision. And then, uh, yeah, I said this in labor, but it was the same company for Hunt Game at the time. And then uh, during my graduate study, I actually did three internships in three different companies. Uh, one was Google and uh, followed by uh, Microsoft and then uh, Amazon. So I was kind of lucky because my advisor um, went to Google for his uh, sabbatical. So I just followed him to work together. And after his sabbatical, he actually he quits from the faculty position and he went to Amazon. So I just followed him again. So uh, that's how I managed to uh, do this many internships during our uh, PhD. And something more personal. Uh, do you know this game? This is quite old now. I'm a big fan of um, Angry Birds. And I actually, uh, I got my smartphone uh, when I just started my uh, PhD study. And I 
uh, uh, install this game. And I just played when I have some free time. Uh, you know, uh, when you train some machine learning models, it may take like 15 minutes and you don't want to do something else during the time. So I just played uh, this game a little bit. And after one year, actually, I uh, have very uh, big uh, accomplishments, which was I was the world champion of the Angry Birds in 2011. That was actually just for five minutes because this uh, leaderboard is updated um, uh, in real time. So I was kicked out of that uh, just in a few minutes, but this was official. So I was the world champion. And uh, some of my friends actually gave me the, uh, yes, Someone raise the hands. Uh, yeah, I think that was me, but I'm sorry. I just misclicked the button. Ah, OK, it's OK. Thanks. Yeah, so uh, some of my friends actually uh, gave this uh, big dar uh, for my birthday gift. But I posted on my Facebook that I got this from Rovio.com, who uh, developed the, the Angry Birds, recognizing the fact that I was the world champion. And everybody actually believed, trusted that. So uh, it, this was my um, one of the biggest accomplishments during my uh, graduate study. And actually, I'm a uh, uh, computer game player. Uh, I play these games for a very, very long time. Uh, the Uncharted Waters, it, this was like 16 years already. And uh, I also play the um, Pokemon Go. If you are playing this, just let me know. In the last semester, one student actually came in and we got friends in, in the game and we are yeah, still playing together. So if you, if you play this game, just let me know. And uh, I'm a world traveler. I love traveling over, all over the world. So um, anyone who can recognize this place? Peru. Peru, yeah. Yeah, this is called Machu Picchu. Uh, it, it's, it's in uh, Peru, uh, nearby the city Cusco, which was the, uh, the capital of the Incan Empire. So I, I dreamed to go, uh, go there. And I, it, this was actually my third or fourth year of my PhD. Uh, so I, I, um, during my PhD, I actually uh, traveled a lot because um, in, in the US, during the Christmas and the New Year's holidays, actually nobody works. And I just uh, traveled all over the world. I would call this uh, as my second job. And um, yeah, can you recognize this place? Anyone? You may type in the chat, or you can just say um, using the microphone. Moai Island. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, Easter Island. So yeah, this is called Easter Island or Isla de Pascua in Spanish in, in Chile. So this is part of Chile, but uh, it's quite far from their mainland. So it's like five hours by flight. And um, including these Moai sculptures, actually the entire island is really beautiful. So I, I spent there uh, about a week and the entire island is like just Hawaii, but it's undeveloped. So uh, I would definitely recommend uh, going to this place uh, in your lifetime. This was another trip uh, that I've done in graduate school. Uh, this is uh, Sahara Desert in Morocco. So there uh, I slept over one night uh, in, in, in the middle of the desert. So I thought that it was really cool, but actually it's not just cool, it's really cold, crazy cold, because it, uh, it was the December, actually the last day of the year. So I, I thought it was really meaningful and I have the start of the new year in, in, the, in the heart of the desert. It was cool, but yeah, it was extremely cold. Wow, that, that was really crazy. So I would like to recommend this place, but not in the winter. The, the uh, desert in the winter is crazy cold. And this place is in uh, south part of Argentina, um, which is called El Calafate. This is summer there. So you may be surprised. This is summer there. So it's the, the temperature is about like zero or the uh, plus five degrees. So that is the definition of winter in, in our uh, atmosphere, like in Korea or in the US. But there, uh, the, the, because this is in the Southern hemisphere, the, uh, 
the uh, seasons are uh, the opposite. So in December, they are summer. And because this is too south, um, December is the, uh, it's like the June in the, in the Northern hemisphere. So they call it summer, but it was uh, perfect for us uh, as a winter visit. So uh, I saw a lot of glaciers and I actually walked on top of that. It was really cool experience there. And uh, anyone know uh, this place? Probably harder than others. Is it Cambodia? Cambodia, similar. Thailand? Thailand, similar. I went here for my honeymoon, part of my honeymoon. It is uh, Laos? Laos? Laos is similar, but no. <laughs> Where are you? Myanmar? Yes, it's actually Myanmar. So the city called Bagan in Myanmar. Uh, there are like um, more than 1,000 or 3,000 of these uh, towers, uh, some Buddhism towers. And uh, you can actually see on one of these uh, top, you can actually see over all over the places. And it's full of these kind of uh, towers, which is really beautiful, especially during the sunset. I, I definitely recommend here. Um, and the, all the prices are really cheap. And very interesting fact, in Myanmar, their um, cash is in the same value of Korean won. So if you buy something in, uh, actually it's 1,000 Korean won is same to 1,000 chat in their uh, money. So it was really convenient, but it's, everything is really cheap. So um, like um, dinner at the five-star hotels, is just cost like 7,000 uh, chat, which is just 7,000 Korean won, which is really cheap, but great experience and people are really nice um, so yeah we had a really fun time here and probably this is the last picture of my travel uh, you may know where it is uh, where i'm not a christian but i really enjoyed travel to uh, jerusalem in israel so uh, israel is really historical city so nobody calls five 500 year old building is historical it's just modern building so we I actually here uh, went here for a conference and we had a banquet in some castle, which is 500 years old, but that was the relatively new one. We just had uh, some wine and had some events there. Uh, and 2000 old year buildings are uh, treated as old one and historical buildings. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, meeting people there and um, looking around all different cultures from Christians and Muslims and all other religions. Um, and it was really good experience for me too. So yeah, uh, this is, I just showed a small uh, number of pictures there, but I have traveled over like 55 countries so far in uh, more than 200 cities. But still, there are uh, 150 countries to visit more. Uh, so uh, in some day I would like to go to Africa and Russia and Greenland and Mongolia where India, many places are left, so. Uh, this is a uh, story of myself. Well, in the last semester, I actually asked all the students to introduce by themselves, but uh, this year, uh, this, with this semester, we have too many students, so I will skip that. And um, actually, machine learning is uh, one of the best thing with machine learning is that we can travel all over the world. Uh, so unlike other um, disciplines uh, or study of areas, um, Computer science, especially machine learning, is organized by conferences mostly instead of journals. So when we do some research and when we publish papers, conferences are the uh, main venues. And we have a lot of conferences and top conference. All of these are considered as one of the top conferences in the, in the machine learning areas. Um, NIPS or Neural Information Processing System, this is one of the best uh, machine learning conferences usually held in North America uh, in the winter. And ICMR is the International Conference on Machine Learning. It's uh, going all over the world uh, every year. So uh, it rotates the continents every year. Uh, as far as I know, 2023, ICMR will be in Korea, in the, in the COEX. So uh, yeah, and more. Uh, CBPR is one of the best con uh, computer vision conferences. Uh, usually it's in, held in, uh, in North America. And ICCV or ECCV, uh, they are also at the top computer vision conferences. So there are a lot of traveling opportunities when you have a paper uh, published here. And uh, that is a good motivation for me to focus on my research. 
Okay, uh, let me talk more about some official stuff. So my office is in um, Graduate School of Data Science, which is in um, Research Park or Yeonggu Gongwon in Korean, uh, building 942. And my room is in 422. So uh, if you have any questions or if you'd like to um, consult anything with me, uh, you can just uh, drop by. Um, so I welcome any topic uh, including like lectures, homeworks, projects, or research discussions, or career developments, or I can uh, also talk more about uh, my experience in industry, and also just personal stuff like uh, travel recommendations or playing game together. Everything is great, so uh, I always uh, welcome students for a visit. But I would like to ask you to make an appointment first because I have too many meetings, and if you just drop by, if I'm free, uh, I'm welcome to. I'll talk with you, but if I already have a meeting, that may be tricky. So uh, send me an email to schedule. And uh, yeah, uh, please visit. Uh, and uh, probably most of you already have received email. And I know that more than half uh, actually did that already. But um, this is a reminder for the initial survey. So. I would like to learn more about you, your background and your prerequisite knowledge and uh, your research and more. So I uh, prepared this initial survey. And uh, if you have, haven't done that yet, please do so by uh, this Friday. So uh, I already shared the slides to you. So you may have the link here. Uh, or if uh, when the, uh, the ETL is back, then you can also find the link in the first page of our course on ETR. And uh, yeah, Gmail account collection, if you haven't done that, this uh, you can uh, please, please update this as well. But uh, I manually actually found all of your uh, SNU accounts and filled that. So uh, please feel free to edit that if you'd like to. OK, some more admin, uh, administrative things for this course. Uh, let me introduce uh, the TA for this course, uh, Song Su Ha. He is the master's student in my lab. Um, and he took this course last semester, and he was the top one, the, uh, the, uh, the first student. So uh, I'm very happy to uh, have him as my TA. And he will be your uh, contact point for any homeworks, questions, or um, any, anything you'd like to ask about the course materials, uh, please feel free to send him an email or myself as well. Uh, Songsu, are you here? Yeah, I'm here. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Um, yeah, he's sitting in uh, the same building uh, in the same floor of, uh, with me. Um, so yeah, uh, he'll be helping you for, for this course for this semester. And I have another PA, uh, which is also a student of my lab, uh, Song Chan Park. Uh, are you here? Probably not. Uh, yeah, Song Chan is not here, but uh, he will be another TA to uh, um, help you help you guys for this course uh, during this semester. So uh, we have the office hours. So Song Su will be uh, waiting for you for any questions during uh, this time on Fridays. And Song Chan will have another uh, office hours on Tuesdays. And you may remember that uh, myself also had the office hours. Uh, remember, what was that? Yeah. My office hour is on Monday, 2 to 3 PM. But please feel free to um, send me an email for any other time for a meeting. And during the time, I will be uh, waiting for, for you guys. But Still, uh, I recommend you to uh, make an appointment because uh, more than one student can come uh, to walk in. So uh, that's always recommended. And uh, this is the course website. So uh, please uh, bookmark this website. And I will upload all the reading materials and the link for the uh, class uh, lecture slides. So And also, it will have the due dates for each homework and everything. So. Uh, it will be announced mainly there, not on ETR. So we're both ETR and uh, this website. But uh, yeah, we are going to use this website for our main source of uh, information. So yeah, please use this website. 
And the uh, textbook for this course will be mainly three things. And the most important thing is the uh, reading materials that I actually upload here. So I will have some lecture notes or uh, some paper links, uh, and those are required to read. Uh, please read it. Uh, I will ask some questions in the paper in, in the exam. So it's required reading. And these textbooks are actually suggested readings. So it's not really required, but I really strongly suggest uh, to uh, read these. So the textbooks are uh, Probabilistic Machine Learning, uh, an introduction, which was uh, written by Kevin Murphy. He's really famous guy uh, of this tech, uh, because of this textbook mainly. And he was, um, where well, he wrote this book long time ago, but recently he uh, is revising this book. So this second edition is just part of it is available. And the second volume is actually, uh, it's uh, in the middle of his uh, work. But uh, this copy is available online. So you will be able to see that in, uh, in this website. Uh, I have linked those, uh, the PDF version of these textbooks. And also the Deep Learning by Ian Goodfellow uh, and Yosha Benjo, where these guys are really famous in deep learning. Um, this textbook uh, is slightly older, but it has all the necessary con uh, contents there. So I also recommend to read this book, especially you can see the suggested uh, chapters or sections to read uh, in each day. So like this, P stands for this probabilistic machine learning, D stands for this deep learning. And both of these textbooks are free online. Uh, you can just print it. And uh, one of the most important parts of today's lecture, the so prerequisites, uh, I uh, would like to emphasize that it is really important to have intermediate programming skills to follow this course. Yeah, you may see this t-shirt for uh, someone to debug my code. Please don't do that. You should code it yourself. So we will have individual programming assignments and you need to do that by yourself. Uh, and we will also have the team projects, uh, which we uh, you basically uh, work on uh, writing a paper uh, from your um, original research. I will talk more about that in the later slides. So if you don't have uh, strong programming skills in Python, you will have a hard time to follow this course. I'm kind of warning you. Um, so you should be able to code, uh, basically you should be able to code what you think in Python. So given some data, and you may think uh, in your head, um, in your brain, that uh, I'd like to move this data to this um, data structure, and then I would like to manage something, and then uh, build some models and feed it to that. And uh, from the output, you'd like to evaluate. You can logically think all of these, but uh, if you're not able to uh, transfer it to actual code, then it will be really hard for you to actually take this course. So. If you have um, enough experience on Python, and if you have basic knowledge about the NumPy or TensorFlow, and if, uh, if you have taken some basic machine learning course before, you should be fine. But if you haven't done your homework by yourself, someone heavily helped you, then you may have some hard time. So uh, think about this, um, and if you think that uh, if, it's, if you are not sure if you have uh, enough programming, sp programming skills, just let me know and I will try to help you to judge. And all others are actually just recommended or optional, but it's, if you have some knowledge, uh, it's better. So basic calculus and linear algebra will be used in, in this course. Uh, so differentiation or chain rule will be uh, used, as, especially at the beginning of this course. And matrix or tensor uh, terminologies or concepts and operations. These are basic things, uh, how to multiply matrix and the vector, and when we can do that, when we cannot do that, uh, that kind of very uh, simple stuff. But if you're not familiar with this, you may need some extra study, and I will try to help you if you need. And data structures and algorithms, we don't heavily use the uh, complex data structures in this course, but uh, sometimes we, we may need some basic understanding of data structures. And I will also use the big O notation uh, without any additional explanation. So if you don't know what it is, maybe it, uh, this course can be really hard for you. So just let me know if you have any question. And uh, machine learning basics are recommended if you uh, have taken just a 
very uh, you know, beginners, uh, beginner level of uh, machine learning class before, this should be okay. Um, but if you don't know anything about machine learning and if you are new to computer programming, then this course will be definitely too hard for you. And it, at the very beginning of our uh, lectures, um, the first seven or eight lectures will be uh, reviewing the basic concepts of machine learning and deep learning using image classification as its example. So uh, that month, the first month will be a good chance for you to review all of these materials, but it may be, you, you may feel that it's a little bit fast paced because this is review uh, basically. And uh, English is important because this is English course. Um, and also uh, the, the final team paper will be uh, uh, written in English in, in CVPR format. So um, yeah, um, English is always important. And um, if you are not um, competent in uh, writing in English, that maybe uh, even if you have done your project really well, that, but that might degrade your final score. But uh, yeah, I, I hope this um, project will be a good opportunity for you to practice to uh, write a paper in English. Probably most of you need to uh, write a paper in English in the future, especially for your graduate study and the thesis and everything. So uh, yeah. Any question about prerequisites? This is really important part. Hi, Professor. Yes. Uh, is the team team project goes? Uh, how many people will be assigned in one team? Oh uh, yeah, I'll I'll talk about that in the later slides. Ah, okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, let me continue. And these are the topics to be covered in this course. And um, I, will, I will have more slides about these. So yeah, I'm gonna skip this for now. Basically, it will be, we will cover image classification and video classification as the main uh, topic. So first half will be covering most about image classification. And the second half will be about more about videos. And we will also cover like video retriever or representation learning, which is my main projects I've done in, at Google. And learning from multimodal data, which is combination of visual signals and some other modes like text or uh, audio and more. And we will also cover um, more um, advanced topics like object detection or semantic segmentations or image generation or style transfer and more. So if you're not familiar with these things, what, what these uh, things mean, uh, it's okay. I will show some examples at the end of uh, today's class. And uh, these are the approaches we are going to learn. So uh, yeah, I'll, I'll talk more about that later. And uh, yeah, let me be more serious because these are important course rules. Uh, if you are, uh, yeah, these things may not be really important for most of you, but uh, please keep that in mind that um, we are not going to uh, accept any late submission. This is very strict we will have the post-it deadline for each homework and you need to submit that on, on time. But we will give 30 minutes for uh, some grace period because uh, sometimes ETL is down or uh, uh, you actually uh, started uploading uh, five, five minutes before the deadline, but uh, it somehow take like six minutes to uh, upload. So we will give 30, 30 minutes for grace period, but please do your homework and submit it not just five minutes or 30 minutes before, but uh, like several hours before. So um, if after the, after the 30 minutes of the deadline, we are not going to accept your uh, submissions unless you have arranged any exceptions. The exceptions, uh, you should uh, contact me or TAs uh, to arrange these exceptions. And you should have some uh, good reason to do so. For example, uh, you need to attend some conferences and you have to travel like 10 days. And our homework is about two weeks. So uh, you have to be attending there for entire period, most of the period of that homework, then I can give you some extensions. But this is not for uh, the very last minutes. So, so uh, 
some some reasons like you uh, need to uh, you cannot work on the very last day only. That's not a good reason to get an exception. In that case, you have to do that uh, before that. Okay. And the second rule is this is even more important. Please do not share your code or writing or anything directly to someone else in the course. Again, copying other students' work or program code, this is very, very serious violation of students' code of conduct, okay? I'm very serious about this. So if detected, where well, if we cannot detect, then yeah, we, we have no way to punish you. But if we detect, both students will receive F and uh, this incident will be reported to university administration which is very serious uh, results for both of you. So please do not copy and please do not share your codes to someone else. But you can discuss in high level. So you, you may ask to your friends that, how did you implement that? What was the, your, uh, I have some technical issues in, uh, in some part of the algorithm and I, I don't know how to solve it. You may ask your friends uh, where well, I had the same problem, but I uh, managed to solve that in this way. You can just discuss in a high level without sharing the code directly, okay? So if we detect uh, two students have the same code, then uh, that will be very seriously punished, uh, like um, the F and also uh, will be reported to university. So please keep that in mind. And uh, the final grade will not be negotiable for any reason. So. Please think, think of the final grade is just the deterministic function of your uh, individual scores of the, the exams and the homeworks and the projects. I will, I will show the formula in the, in the later slides. But the final grade is something that, uh, it's not a thing that I give you uh, from my decision. It's just the grading criteria is already decided and it's just a deterministic function. And I just follow that rule to decide your final grades. So, Please do not try to negotiate because I have something like uh, I have some financial burden and if I receive C in this class, I cannot uh, receive the uh, financial support and that will be really hard for me. Where well, that kind of things are not negotiable for any reason. So please keep that in mind. But I hope most of you, uh, for everyone actually in this class, will have no problem. Uh, I, I, I would like to trust all, all of you. And um, this, these are the new rules in this semester. So um, I, I usually do not check attendance and I will do the same thing in this semester as well. I, uh, this is the graduate level course and you guys came to graduate school for study. You, you just, you, you came here uh, voluntarily and you registered for this course and you guys are all adults. So I don't wanna check attendance every time uh, who came late and who didn't show up. It's okay if you have any other conflicts or if you believe uh, you have a better way of spending this time for something else, I, it's, it's totally okay with, uh, with me. So I will not check the attendance and I will not uh, degrade if you don't come to the class, it's okay. And if you missed the lecture, actually you can ask me to share these uh, course recordings Then I will share uh, these uh, lecture recordings for you to uh, review it. But I added this new rule this semester. Um, if you don't come to the, the class, it's okay. And if you come to the class and if you turn on your camera, it's also okay. You can do whatever you want. But if you come to class and uh, turn off your camera and just pretend uh, attending it, and if I ask you a question and if you don't answer it, then uh, you may be degraded. So please do not pretend if you're attending. So the, the basic policy is that you have to come. At, uh, when you come, you have to turn on your camera and that's okay. Then uh, when I ask your question, just please answer it. But if your camera is turned off and when I ask your questions, but you don't answer, then there may be a uh, penalty, okay? And uh, this next rule is about the uh, cancellation of the registration or course drops. So. Uh, the official deadline for the course drop is about uh, half of this semester, which is the 26th of October, I guess. Um, but um, because we have uh, team projects and um, that team will be formulated in the first week of October, 
if you drop after that deadline, uh, the team will suffer from less number of students, right? So I strongly encourage you to drop if you'd like to before this uh, team formation. And after the team formation, uh, you will need to uh, explicitly discuss with me for the reason. And uh, you will need special approval for that. So basically the deadline for the course drop will be until the team formation, which is the, the early October. Okay. And uh, this year I don't allow uh, audit auditors uh, for in, in most cases. So uh, because we already have like 95 students in this class. So yeah, because of the capacity, I'm not allowing uh, the, the auditors. And these are the grading criteria. So um, we will have homeworks uh, four times and each of them will be 5%. And we will have midterm and final written exams and we will do this uh, offline. So you need to come to uh, our building uh, in the lecture room to take this exam. And uh, midterm will be around the half of the uh, lectures and it's uh, midterm and final are the same weight, 25% each. And the team project will be 30%. Uh, it will be uh, three things. You need to turn in three things. The proposal will be individual. So all of you need to write a research proposal um, and that will uh, be counted as 5% of your final grades. And once I receive the final, uh, the, the proposals, then I will choose about 20% of them for, um, as a team project topics. And uh, those for those who are selected for this, proposers, uh, you are going to um, work with other uh, students who got uh, rejection from these proposers uh, to formate a team. And then uh, each team will be like four or five students. Uh, I actually have some more slides about that later. So yeah, let me, let me talk about that. But uh, anyway, the team project will be 30%. And this is the most important thing in this class. So if your team doesn't finish your uh, projects in the end, then uh, that will actually hurt the uh, grades a lot. So that is the most important part of this course. And attendance and attitude, I just added it here, but it doesn't uh, come with some percentage. But uh, as I told you, if you just pretend attending, but if, if you're not answering to my questions, then uh, there may be some degrade. degrade. And um, some of you might have heard that I gave very generous final grades in the last semester, but um, that is mainly because I'm using absolute scores for the grading. I, I don't do um, the relative scales. So in the last semester, I uh, gave the grades like this. Your final score is 80 or higher. That was A plus. And uh, it was downgraded by one for every 10 points, which is A0 is 70 or higher. A minus is 60 or higher, something like that. But if you don't take the exam without notice or do not submit two or more homeworks, then uh, it's fair. So, so you have to sub submit most of the homeworks and all the exams. And I'd like to tell you, actually warn you that uh, this course is very, very highly uh, intensive. We, we do require you to uh, finish four homeworks, which is not very easy, uh, I would say. And also the team project is really intensive. Uh, it will basically conducting a research and computer vision with uh, three or four other students. So writing a paper is not uh, an easy thing, as you know. So uh, this, will, this course will be highly intensive and you need to finish all of these where to get a good grade. So uh, this is our warning that uh, if you know the distribution of the last semester, forget about it. It doesn't reflect uh, this semester's uh, the uh, grade distribution because I'm just using the absolute score. You need to get 80 or higher score to get an A plus. Uh, these are subject to change, by the way. Uh, but anyway. And yeah, here's the uh, more details about the team projects. So uh, around the week four, uh, we will have the proposal deadline. So you, uh, all of you actually propose some uh, research idea using machine learning for computer vision uh, problem. So I will uh, go over some more um, detailed examples in, a, in the next few lectures, but um, something like this. Uh, because um, there are many students coming from other departments than uh, computer science or um, the 
data science. Um, so it may be very interesting to use the machine learning approaches in, in the visual data in your uh, expertise area. For example, like biology or medical sciences or anything, you can apply these techniques to in your own area and you can actually conduct the, the projects. And um, developing a new model for some existing tasks like um, Kaggle competition is one of the uh, easiest way to find an interesting problem in the data set you can use for the projects. Or um, you may tackling some specific issue in existing problems like the occlusion in the uh, detection problem. Or uh, you may design some new interesting problem in data set. In the last semester, Two students actually did that. They, uh, they were both, both of them were from uh, College of Agriculture. They uh, actually took some photos of uh, cucumbers in, in, and um, they proposed the segmentation task of that. And it was really fun. So um, actually I'm going to share the, uh, the previous semester's project list uh, in, in, in a uh, next lecture. So you can actually look at uh, what other students have done. And um, extensive experimental study of ex existing algorithms or uh, experimental survey, that's another good way of uh, uh, having a project in this class. Uh, actually, um, if, even though you do not invent something, actually you just com uh, compare existing methods in some systematic way. Uh, that's another um, important contribution to the, to the uh, research community. So I also encourage that. Um, but um, the proposal idea is uh, formed usually better with uh, talking to other people, not just in your brain. So uh, talk to your colleagues or your advisor, or uh, you can. You are also encouraged to come to me or the TAs if you have any ideas. But if you are not sure it's a good topic for this project, always you can ask me or uh, the TAs. And I'm going to give you some comments about the scope or uh, the difficulty and, and more. Uh, so the deadline will be the last week of uh, September. So please start this and think about this early to um, uh, write this proposal. And after you propose, then uh, myself and the TAs will uh, grade them uh, in a week. And um, I will choose uh, about 20% of the proposal. So we have like 90 students. So it will be about like 15 to 20 projects will be selected. And those selected uh, proposer, uh, proposer will be the leader of the projects. So if your project is selected, you are going to lead the project with three or four other students. So to answer the previous question, Changyo, the team will be composed of four or five students. Okay. And if your proposal was not selected, well, unfortunately, but uh, that will be most of you uh, because that will be like 80%, uh, you need to join another pro uh, project. And I'm going to uh, share some spreadsheet uh, to match the teams and you will be able to see the, the selected proposal there and you can contact the, the leader to join the team. So uh, that's how I usually for, uh, formate the team. And I would like to encourage you to take advantage of the diversity of the team. I know that some of you uh, are registering this cl class with uh, other lab mates uh, or friends. It's also good, but uh, in, in many cases, in that case, you will um, have no diversity, the same major or um, same research topics. So I would like to encourage you to work with uh, some various uh, students with from uh, various backgrounds, especially in this uh, semester, we have about 10 uh, international students who are visiting Seoul National University. So I'd like to encourage you to uh, work with them to learn uh, from each other. And after that, you will have like five weeks to work on the projects and you will submit the midterm reports which mainly um, contains the data collection and the initial results from simple baseline models. So uh, the proposal will be mainly about um, what problem you are going to solve. And midterm report is how you are going to solve that and some initial results. And the final report will be about uh, how it actually worked and uh, what, what's your contribution. It's basically a paper. So you will have five weeks until the midterm reports that will be around mid-November. And the final report will be uh, 
around the final exam and the, uh, at the end of the semester. So you will basically write the CVPR paper in LaTeX, uh, the eight pages. Um, and it will need to contain um, detailed model and the final experimental results and observations compared to baseline, everything what you usually see in the, uh, in the papers. And um, once we have the final results and the final paper, and uh, I would like to uh, encourage you to submit that as a workshop or actual conference paper. In the last semester, actually, three teams are uh, doing this. And so we are going to submit that to CVPR this year, which is really great. After uh, working on some course projects with three or four other students, and you have a top conference paper in computer vision, which is really cool. So uh, please take this seriously. And uh, I'd like to ask you to work hard on the projects and we will have good results in the end, then uh, that will help a lot for your uh, career. So, uh, and also whenever you have the team project, it is really important to uh, contribute, uh, especially this semester, we will have like five team members in the team. So maybe one or two of them uh, try to free ride, which is strongly discouraged. And uh, every member needs to uh, contribute equally, but uh, in a different, uh, potentially in various ways. So maybe some of them are more, uh, have more strong uh, programming skills and they may code more, but that's okay. But for other students, they also need to contribute to the project in a different ways, like uh, experimental design or execution and the data analysis, where these are uh, also very important part of the paper. And if you are not uh, very strong in programming, then uh, you may try to uh, contribute more in this uh, other st stuff. So that's my uh, um, suggestion. And uh, please do not try to free ride. Uh, that's the, uh, yeah, that's very important for uh, team projects. Okay, so far I uh, showed all the administrative stuff and the course logistics. So if you have any questions, just let me, uh, let me know now. Excuse me, Professor. Yeah. Yes. Um, I, my name is Jin Kim from Biomedical Engineering. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to ask you uh, two questions first. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, so you said, we are supposed to submit CVPR paper for eight pages. Uh, mm -hmm. As long as I know that's that's the, one of the top conferences existing in vision, computer vision, and I am not really uh, sure like people like me uh, from other majors can make it. So uh, yeah, let me answer the first. I'm not asking you to directly submit to CVPR. Uh, the deadline is actually before our uh, end of class. So uh, you will need to write the final report in CVPR format. It doesn't necessarily mean that your paper needs to be accepted as CVPR. Oh. Okay. okay. This is just for practice. And uh, in the last semester, about 75% uh, of my class was from different uh, backgrounds like you. And all of them did a really good job. And that's not a, a individual work, but you will also have your colleagues in the team. So yeah, you, you will not have any problem. Oh, thanks. Uh, my second, second question, yeah. Yeah, second question being like you said, uh, only three of them uh, were selected last year uh, to submit their jobs uh, works on CVPR actually this year. Is that correct? Actually not, uh, I didn't select just three. I actually selected like almost half. I contacted about eight teams to uh, work together to make it as a paper. But uh, some teams declined my request because they had other things to do in their own labs and it's, oh. it's up to them. So I cannot force them to do it. But I think it's really good for the students uh, to have a good paper uh, at CVPR, or even if it's not CVPR, actually it's good to have a, a published paper out of uh, your work, any work, including the uh, course projects. So that's why I suggest, and I, I am happy to help for that. Uh, so currently just three teams are uh, working with me to make it as a paper, but yeah, if you are willing to do that, and if you have some uh, decent results at the end of the semester, I'm going to ask you to work together. 
Oh, thanks. Uh, my question actually was like, so when you, I I belong to this laboratory, uh, mm -hmm. and I, uh, yeah. So whenever I submit a paper or a conference paper, whatever, I need to put my professor on mm -hmm. a co corresponding author. So, so what's what's that gonna be like if I happen to submit? CPPR with other other members from other majors. It's uh, yeah. Let let's talk about that offline. It's uh, oh. yeah. It, okay. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, any, any other questions? Uh, yeah. Uh, hello. My name is Chang Ho Yun, major in uh, biosystems engineering, and my question is: Can I have multiple proposals? Uh, can, I no. have, can I submit you... uh, multiple one proposal per? It was unusual. Actually, nobody asked that. Uh, please uh, send me an email with your brief ideas, and we can discuss to narrow it down to just one. All right. Thank you. OK. Any other questions? OK, we have about. 25, 20, 20 more minutes. So let me very quickly to go over the introduction of computer vision and its history. What do you see in this video? Anyone? Figure skating. Yes, figure skating. Yes. Anything else? Man and woman. Man and woman, yes. Tracking so, the humans. Mm -hmm. When I ask this question to humans, they usually say like this, figure skating, inner sports, or ice rink. And as uh, one student said, uh, this is called pair skating, one man and one woman as uh, playing together to uh, perform. So how did you know that? How did you answer this from this video? When I ask this question, actually, nobody says, because what does it mean? You just know that, right? You, you cannot explain experience. how. Mm -hmm. Experience. Experience, yes. Yeah, we just know that. We, we just watch this video, and oh, this is figure skating. That's how people understand the video. So that is the, uh, the ability of human called intuition. You ha we have some experience, as one of the students said. We have experience, and we know what it is, and when you watch that exactly the same thing. We recognize that that's the figure skating. That's how human understands the video. What about for machines? For machines, a video is a sequence of images. And what is an image? Image is a two-dimensional matrix or array of pixels, right? What is a pixel? A pixel is usually three or four integers to represent a color, which means for computers, a video is just a sequence of bunch of numbers like this. That's how machine understand the video. And what we would like to do with video understanding is learning some function that takes this, uh, how machine understands the video as input. You'd like to output that, how uh, human understand the video. So uh, bridging this gap between how machine understand the video and how human understand the video, that is the definition of video understanding. OK. Let's do another. Uh, uh, there should be not the case. Okay. Uh, yeah. I usually ask, uh, what do you see in this video? But uh, I already have the answer. So yeah, what do you see in this video? What we usually see? Police chase, that's what uh, people uh, understand this video and how they answer. But what uh, we need to do to uh, understand this video, the first thing using machine learning, what we need to do uh, is recognizing all the stuff happening in this video or in this image, right? So we see that uh, there's a sidewalk and in the park and kids are playing in the back and cars are honking in the back. And there is a person uh, who is running away, and a policeman is chasing him uh, and shouting, stop. So um, as human, we 
very easily understand that the main topic of this scene is the police chase, not the kids in the back or the cars in the back. But the very first step is uh, what we uh, what is visible and audible. We just uh, figure out and recognize all of these first, and then uh, we need to answer what is the central topic of this. So video understanding or image understanding is not as simple as just recognition. We we also need to figure out what's actually happening and what is the main topic of that. And what is this? Is there any structure of this video? Uh, maybe we can take advantage of some structures like this. Uh, so um, it intro introduction and then uh, the discussion in the policy stations and then actual example of outdoor chase. But understanding this kind of structure can help us to figure out what is the main topic of this. So video understanding is main, mainly uh, the um, answering to these questions. Uh, one is, why do we want to make this kind of video uh, from the creator's uh, perspective? Or why do we want to watch this video? What information do we want to learn from this? Uh, so answering to these questions, questions will be uh, the main topic of the video or image. So what is computer vision? Uh, I brought this from the de definition from the Wikipedia. So computer vision is an interdiscipl interdisciplinary scientific field that deals with how computers can gain high level understanding from digital images or videos. So digital videos or images, that's uh, what I called uh, how machine understands the video. And high level understanding is how human understands the video. So that is the definition of computer vision. And uh, basically, this is same as um, implementing our uh, the role of our eyes in, in the computer systems. So here it says that um, it seeks to understand and automate tasks that the human visual system can do. So just basically made, uh, making our eyes in the computer systems. And we have very short history in uh, computer vision. But, uh, this was the very first uh, computer vision um, paper or uh, research, uh, which was done in, in 1963. So this gentleman, uh, Lawrence Roberts, uh, wrote this um, uh, thesis for his PhD thesis at uh, MIT. So given this image, input image, you have this, uh, you, you are actually looking at two uh, objects in 3D, but it was represented in, uh, actually projected and represented in 2D images. And how should we represent uh, when, it, when we um, rotate it or when we see this scene from different uh, view, viewpoints? In human brain, that's really uh, easy to imagine that when we actually look at this from this side, it will lo look like this. But from how uh, computers store this uh, image, that's just a sequence of the pixels in, in, uh, in this 2D uh, space. All the pixel values are completely different if you compare these two. Even, even if human can understand that these are uh, intuitively, they, they are uh, coming from the same scene from different viewpoints. So what should we do? How can we compute these uh, pixel values? Uh, so that is the emergence of the computer vision in, uh, in history. And later, uh, very slowly, in the area was developed. And this is another example in 1992. Uh, it was the, about the motion tracking. So how can we track the motion of this guy reading the textbook? So uh, from the edges, uh, they did something, uh, I don't know the details, but these are one of the uh, important work in computer vision. But it just took quite a long time, already 30 years. And after that, uh, people got interested more in object recognition in general. So there are multiple um, detailed questions or tasks so object classification is just uh, recognizing all the stuff that we can actually see in the, in the image. Here, uh, given this image, the answer is person, ship, and dog, because we can see all of them here. But in this task, we don't need to specify where it is. In the uh, object detection task, the task is more sophisticated that you need to find out that uh, this image contains person, ship, and dog. But not just that, you also need to locate them in, in uh, using the bounding box, which is the tightest uh, box contains uh, each object in, in, in the bounding box. And the semantic segmentation is even more sophisticated that uh, in pixel level, you need to specify which, uh, in, which pixel belongs to which objects and for all the pixels in the image like that. 
And object instance segmentation is even more sophisticated. So if we see more than one instance for each object, for example, here we have five ships, then which pixel belongs to which ship? So we need to uh, segment all of them. So we are going to cover all of these topics in the first half of our lectures, uh, our class. And one uh, example of uh, the object detection is a face detection and recognition. So face detection is basically object detection, but the target is the human face. So uh, given this image, we'd like to find out where uh, we see the, the, uh, the human face like that. And the human face recognition is uh, not just locating the face, but also we'd like to figure out who it is. So we need some data for each person probably. Uh, and for example, in this one, we would say that this is Carrie, this is Kate and so on. So this kind of uh, things uh, are emerged in 2001, and which is, uh, after that it was developed a lot, very, very quickly using the emergence of deep learning. And this, all of these are pre-deep learning era, by the way. So um, this is very interesting work uh, in 3D reconstruction. So in 2009, um, I actually learned this uh, when I was taking the computer vision class in my uh, graduate study, which I, I really liked uh, this application. So image is usually a projection of the 3D objects in the reality, right? And um, when you collect all the uh, photos taken from this Colosseum in Rome, and you uh, collect all of them from only one uh, 2D image, it is not possible to reconstruct the entire 3D images out of it. But if we have multiple images from different viewpoints, actually we can reconstruct the, the shape of this, uh, the target in 3D. And they did that using the uh, photos shared by travelers in, in Google Maps. So I, I really like this title, Building Rome in a Day. They, they collected all the data and built this uh, point clouds in 3D. And uh, this is really cool because uh, we didn't have any deep learning stuff at that time. So far, I just showed um, computer vision uh, works before the deep learning era. But um, now let me tell you more about uh, history of AI. In AI, uh, the AI actually started, emerged in uh, 1943. So uh, at that time, we had some idea about electronic brain. How can you model the, the brain, human brain, in, in a uh, computer system? And at that time, the neural network idea was proposed initially. Uh, at the very beginning, we uh, had the adjustable weights, but those weights were designed uh, uh, assigned by a human, not a computer system or the data. But uh, after that, it took actually another 14 years to uh, have the learnable weights, uh, which took a very long time. But um, it's, it's, it is called perceptron. So one perceptron is composed of uh, multiple inputs, and each input is uh, multiplied with some weights, and then it's combined. And if it's above the threshold, it fires. Otherwise, it doesn't. So it's very simple. Uh, actually, the simplest uh, neural network, which is called perceptron. So at that time, people uh, believed that where well, this uh, perceptron will um, we build the human brain in a computer system, and we'll be able to uh, implement any AI stuff. And this is the future of the computer science and AI. They they believed that until they encounter X or problem, which is very uh, simple, but uh, simple, it, it looks very simple. So um, when you have the black uh, dots are, uh, black classes are uh, orange like that and whites are like that, then we cannot uh, model this uh, kind of classes using a single perceptron. Right. I don't wanna talk more, more about the details for here, but anyway, this was a very serious problem that uh, even started the AI winter or the dark age. So all of the funding agencies uh, stopped funding uh, the project in AI just because of this. And it started the cold uh, era of the AI. After that, like 15 years later, uh, a genius called uh, Jeffrey Hinton uh, proposed that we can actually solve this XOR problem by using more than one uh, perceptron actually uh, stacking more than one layer of the perceptron. So it is called multi-layered perceptron. And he proposed an idea of back propagation to train these uh, more complex perceptrons or neural networks uh, 
uh, from the data. So we are going to briefly review the back propagation and the, uh, the idea of neural networks in the uh, beginning of our lecture, the lecture four. And then uh, in around 2010, we have, uh, now we have uh, bigger data in, uh, from the internet and uh, the hardware accelerators like GPUs. Now we are actually ready to actually train these uh, neural network ideas in real, uh, real world data set in scale. And that actually uh, brought this deep learning revolution in 2012. So ImageNet classification task was uh, started in 2010. And um, the task was given an image. And your task is uh, classifying it. So this is still drawn. Uh, so when, when you input this image to the machine, and it needs to output the, this label, basically the image classification task. The error rate was about 28% or 26% until 2011. But at uh, 2012, um, that dropped like 10%. And after that, um, in, it, after three years, actually, that became even better than how human does. So 2012 is called uh, the AD1, the first year of age of deep learning. Or, uh, and before then, that is called BC, uh, before CONVNET. So when I say that it's 84, that means like 20. 16 uh, or 81 is 2012, some, something like that. So uh, this is kind of just joke, but um, this is kind of a revolution because the deep neural network changes all the things in machine learning and computer vision, especially in computer vision. So uh, yeah, we are going to learn uh, more specific about these models in our lecture later. Yeah, he's the Jeffrey Hinton, and uh, we had a uh, cartoon in Yabame Gongde Seng Mana. If you're interested, you can actually watch that here. Sorry, this is written in Korean. Yeah, he's also uh, working as a dual job like me in uh, teaching in University of Toronto and also working for Google, half and half. And after that, uh, the um, the ImageNet was kind of conquered after like 86. So uh, it, it, uh, 2018, it was officially finished. But now people are using more uh, complex and more bigger and more sophisticated data sets to uh, make it even better. So the object detection accuracy is like starting from 21% in 2008. Now it's more than like 80% uh, precise in, in these uh, complex data sets. So, People are uh, continuously working on computer visions, and the uh, number of paper submissions are like doubled uh, or like five times. Actually, after that, 2021, it was like 10,000, over 10,000, so which is like five times larger than 10 years ago. So it's uh, crazy increasing, uh, it's skyrocketing the number of uh, participants and submissions and reviewers and all, all the things in, in the conferences. And this is. Uh, the video data set uh, corresponding to the image net in, in video domain. And I was actually the participants of creating this data set and running the workshops. But uh, yeah, because of the time, I'm going to skip the details. So this class is called Machine Learning for Visual Understanding. And this is not a traditional computer vision course. So we are not going to uh, cover all the topics like shift features or uh, pre-deep learning era stuff uh, in computer vision, but we're Focus more on machine learning uh, methods for uh, visual understanding. But also, this is not a fundamental machine learning course. So we are not going to teach you all the details of machine learning and um, uh, topics or tasks that is not related to visual understanding. So we focus on visual understanding and machine learning. And uh, we are going to learn how to apply the machine learning approaches for various visual understanding problems. So this is the goal of this course. And yeah, in the next two minutes, I'm going to quickly go over the tasks and applications we are going to cover in this course. So this is the object recognition task. So uh, given an image, we would like to locate the target objects and uh, in the bounding box. But you can also apply this idea to some specific domain uh, of your expertise, like uh, the medical images or medical videos. You can locate some cancer or some uh, some issues. Uh, I don't know. This, uh, so. Uh, you can actually apply this idea to your expertise areas. Same for the video uh, classification. So here, the tasks are mostly the, the actions instead of just objects. 
And you can also specialize in some other uh, areas like uh, hand, re hand uh, gesture recognition. And uh, spatial and temporal localization is uh, understanding the scene uh, in even more details. So spatial localization uh, asks you to localize what's happening in, within the, uh, the image, uh, where it's actually happening. And the temporal localization is asking when it's actually happening within the video. So given some text queries like this, uh, the, the task is uh, locating the start and end point of that uh, within the video. And yeah, we already talked about the segmentation. Uh, we have the sem semantic segmentation and the instant segmentation. We will uh, cover this in our uh, lectures later. And tracking is another interesting um, application. So in the video, you'd like to track uh, each moving object uh, moving from where to where. So uh, you may also apply this to some scientific stuff like the cell tracking, uh, which is really challenging. It, it doesn't look like that, but it's really challenging because of the scale. And also uh, in hurricane tracking in these days in, uh, in the US, the Louisiana was kind of disrupted a lot by uh, the, the hurricane recently a few days ago. Um, using the computer vision techniques, you can actually track uh, where the hurricane is going and you can predict from its uh, trace uh, where it will be and how strong it will be. So you can warn people to um, evacuate, not using the traditional scientific models, but you can use the deep learning models and it's even more precise. And multimodal learning is combining the visual signals and other stuff. Like the, in the uh, left one, we use the sound information or audio information to learn the relationship between uh, the sounds and the objects. For example, if you're playing drum like that, we usually hear, we expect to hear some sounds of drums, right? Very simple idea, but it's really effective. Or we also use the text information associated with the, the videos or images. So uh, it is also, very interesting uh, problems. We are going to cover uh, this in, uh, at the end of our class, uh, at the end of our course. Um, image captioning is given an image. We would like to describe it using some machine learning models. And uh, visual Q&A is given a question in text and an image. They, uh, we would like to generate the answer, which is really cool, right? It's, it's, uh, it's a very sophisticated task. And star transfer, this will be our very last topic in this course, will be uh, like uh, star transfer from the zebra to we, uh, we can generate the image of horse in the same place, in the same uh, formation. Or we can combine some images and some star image, uh, for example, the uh, um, paintings of some famous uh, painters, then we would like to generate some images uh, as if it was drawn by that painter. And yeah, that's what why we are doing this, uh, but uh, I'm going to skip this. Uh, so yeah. So okay, so this is the end of today's lecture. And um, welcome to the course. And if you have any questions, you can ask it now, or you can send it to uh, my email. Then I will, uh, if it's personal, yeah, I will, I will answer that in the email. But if you have any questions, please feel free to ask me now. If not, okay, today is done and uh, see you on Monday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you Professor. Bye bye. Thank you, Professor. Nice day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.